was pres that was that she was presciently voted most likely to succeed in high school, that she has two sisters and a brother, that she was trained in Chicago at Steppenwolf and right here at Eastern Illinois University under the late Glendon Gabbard, that she is a dog lover, that she was married for 12 years to Peter Friedman and has a 14-year-old daughter, that she is the recipient of a Tony Award as well as a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Hamptons Film Festival, that she interacts with other professionals in order to mobilize the actor Joan Allen, whose name appears in credits and who underlies the many roles through which we've come to know her. For instance, that this morning she is shooting a film with Jeremy Irons in New Mexico, are all facts that tend not to intrude through publicity into the manifestations that we see on screen. She does not flavor her performances with a Hollywood reputation as does one of her very favorite screen actors, Robert Downey Jr. Nor are her performances flavored by public knowledge that Downey is one of her favorites. The comparatively short, technically delimited roles in which she's been presented on screen, received by us as performances, have had an exceptional purity in the case of Joan Allen. Purity simply in that they've stood without subsidiary or background comment from their source. Strictly speaking, Joan Allen is not a movie star, although it is in the movies that we tend to see her, and she certainly shines like a star. She is not a star in that a discreet and reproducible Joan Allen-ness is not part of her characterizations in the way that, for example, a discreet and reproducible Bette Midler-ness tends to glow through everything Bette Midler does or a Candace Bergen-ness through the every screen appearance of Candace Bergen, or a Gwyneth Paltrow-ness through the many performances of Blythe Danner's talented daughter. No matter what the star does on screen, she is always to some degree essentially and spectacularly herself, trading upon the, quote, monopoly upon a particular personality, unquote, that Janet Steiger argues she controls. Like many before her, Joan Allen is a character actor whose characters utterly replace her on screen. To this date, with two striking but also partial exceptions, John McKenzie's When the Sky Falls and Rod Lurie's The Contender, both from 2000, she has played supporting, not leading roles. In Sky Falls, she is clearly the main protagonist, yet Unless, as fans or scholars, we are focusing to find Joan Allen-ness on screen, it is the character, not the actor, that we remember in this relatively obscure Irish film. In The Contender, it could be argued, Gary Oldman, who produced the film, and Jeff Bridges, who played the key role of the President of the United States, had star billing, even though Allen's name is above the title, and her Lane Hansen, a sensitive and intelligent senator nominated to be vice president and thus run through the gauntlet of a Senate confirmation process, a kind of anti-prototype of Sarah Palin, was never away from the audience's eye as the central and eponymous character in the film. These two films, at any rate, are the only ones to date with Joan Allen that could reasonably be called Joan Allen vehicles, this ironically in view of the fact that her Legion fans some of them professional critics, have such profound admiration for the quality of her work that they think of every film she is in as belonging wholly to her. For example, one writer fondly recalls a film critic friend who snoozed through Oliver Stone's Nixon, yet disciplined herself to wake up whenever Alan as Pat Nixon was on screen. <laughs> in general, Allen's roles are relatively small and at best secondary in the overall structure of the films which contain them. To name just some, loyal but goofy Maddie Nagel in Francis Ford Coppola's Peggy Sue Got Married, and blind Reba McLean in Michael Mann's Manhunter, both 1986. Wonderful, wondrous, and wondering Vera Tucker in Coppola's Tucker, The Man in His Dream, 1988. Tender Bonnie Waitskin in Searching for Bobby Fisher by Steve Zalian, 1993. 
Brittle Tormented Pat Nixon for Oliver Stone, 1995. Morally Passionate Elizabeth Proctor in Nicholas Heitner's The Crucible, 1996. Patient Supportive Dr. Eve Archer in John Woo's Face Off, and Overstarched Ellie Hood in The Ice Storm by Ang Lee, both 1997. Ubermom Betty Parker in Gary Ross's Pleasantville, 1998. The Repressed Mother Anne Hamilton in Nick Cassavetes' is The Notebook, 2004. And for Paul Greengrass, The Bureaucratic Ice Princess Pam Landy in The Born Supremacy and The Born Ultimatum, 2004-2007, by Allen's own confession, the most difficult part she ever played. For a character actor, building a career such as the one evidenced by these roles involves certain professional strategies as we can come to see if we examine the place of acting in the filmmaking process. In her penetrating 1950 ethnography of Hollywood movie making, Hollywood the Dream Factory, a book that persists in having relevance today in many important ways, Hortense Powdermaker antedates much of what later scholars of performance, including Richard de Cordova, Richard Dyer, and James Nairmore, came to say about screen acting by describing a well-defined hierarchy of actors in which position is determined by income, and by observing that in order to produce and guarantee income, actors must find a way to get constant work in an environment where they do not typically control their own access to roles. A good actor, she writes, can be made by a strong role which offers potentialities for him to develop, or he can be embarrassed by a meaningless one. Further, quoting again, this role problem is exaggerated by the Hollywood emphasis on typecasting, unquote, in which once an actor accomplishes the creation of a character especially well, quote, it is then assumed that he can do nothing else, unquote. While gifted actors strongly object to doing the same role over and over again, nevertheless, writes Powdermaker, quote, the Hollywood system is not sympathetic to this point of view, and the actors have constantly to struggle against, unquote, an absolute power. In the days in which she was writing, that power was the studio. Now it is the big producer, the big agent, or the producer-agent combination since film projects are generated by powerful individuals capable of assembling production teams which include character players contracted for limited but dramatically vital work. Character players are notable in their importance to Hollywood filmmaking since their presence in central but off-center narrative positions fleshes out the realism of the story while also providing star performers with the opportunity to simulate social density in their screen interactions. While success in screen acting can be attributable to one's looks and personality, as in the case of movie stars, such as Jeff Bridges, Kevin Kline, Nicolas Cage, Anthony Hopkins, John Travolta, and Matt Damon, with all of whom Alan has played on screen, Powdermaker emphasizes that most actors and directors agree that character actors are the most talented of all the players. An extended quote, these supporting players are chosen primarily for their ability, and there is keen competition for the jobs. Moreover, they must make good on their own, for everything on the set is not geared to their success. Cameraman, electrician, and director use most of their energy and time to getting the best results for the stars and have little left for the others. Often the character actor playing a second lead is literally a supporting player. If the star is not gifted, he carries the real burden of the acting, and through the skillful manipulation of the camera, the star's lack of ability is at least partly concealed. The character actor could be described as a brassiere for the star, literally holding him or her up. <laughs> The centrality of the star springs from his being a major investment of the production. This because it is believed that star performances are instrumental in guaranteeing the success or failure of a film at the box office. As, as Luke said upstairs half an hour ago, Tom Cruise could read the phone book and they would sell the film around the world. 
This feature of the star system of the golden days of Hollywood, 1933 through 1968, persists today in the face of stars' relative independence from studios and protective studio contracts.